part here. And uh, we're, we want to welcome you to another uh, Wealth Builders podcast here. And I think this is Facebook Live. And so today we're excited. I'm going to talk about how to start your own nonprofit. We're going to give you some really strong business insights as well as nonprofit insights. And so uh, we have a really a power packed program of information that I think will really help you. There's been a lot of interest in the nonprofit world. And we teach a lot of course on business and nonprofits as well as the other things here at Wealth Builders. But before I actually get into the teaching today, I have our host and our vice president of Wealth Builders, Karen Conrad Metcalf, that's on with me. Uh, uh, and she's gonna share some really exciting things that we want you to know about. So Karen, welcome. And I'm gonna pitch it to you and let you take it from here. Then I'll come back and we'll get into some really good information and teaching. Awesome. Thank you, Billy. Hey, welcome, everybody. We are so glad to have you with us tonight. And we're just sharing with Billy how excited we are that he is on doing this webinar tonight. You know, he's got this little side hustle <laughs> called CEO of Andrew Womack Ministries. And uh, we're just really excited about him being here. And, you know, the information that you're going to receive from him tonight is gonna be so valuable. So we're just so glad to have you all with us. I'm gonna give you a few updates just to keep you up to date on some of the Wealth Builders things. First of all, um, hey, Billy has got a brand new book out. It's called God's Road to Financial Success. And we are just sharing that my husband got it because Billy sent it out to all the partners and he's just glued, just reading that book and could hardly put it down. So hey, if you wanna order that, go to Amazon and order that, or you can go to our website at wealthbuilders.org, but it is an awesome book. And so you want to get a copy of this, believe me. Also, I wanna remind you that we have got a workshop coming up and it is called the 2022 Wealth Builders Business Development and Nonprofit Workshop. You know, we really listen to all of you and we, we hear about the things that that you want to learn about and we found that a lot of you want to learn about being an entrepreneur and developing your business and also so many of you have a heart for nonprofit and so the first time ever with the business workshop we're actually doing two tracks on Saturday afternoon there's going to be more than 20 hours of teaching and you're going to learn things about marketing you're going to learn things about the legal setup revenue streams how to really build your business plan. And so you don't want to miss this. And you can register, go to wealthbuilders.org slash events. You can learn more about it and get registered. We have very limited tickets. We're about halfway sold out, just so you all know, in person. So get your tickets now. Also, did you know that Wealth Builders has a weekly podcast and uh, Billy has been doing an amazing job of teaching some podcasts. It's every Thursday. It's about 15 minutes, just power packed information. So check that out. And finally, Wealth Builders University is a learning platform that Billy and Becky have put together to help you from wherever you are, get the content in deep of Wealth Builders. So you'll find multiple courses in there and each course has five to eight lessons. It's the best deal out there. You can check that out at wbuniversity.online. And this is an interactive webinar. And so we wanna hear from you, ask questions. We're gonna have Billy teaching for about 45 minutes and we're gonna reserve about 15 minutes at the end to answer your questions. So if you're on Zoom, go ahead and enter your question in the chat section. And if you're on Facebook, go ahead and enter that question on the comment section. And we've got a whole team that's standing by. We will answer as many questions as possible. So with that, Billy, we're so excited to hear about nonprofits tonight. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Karen. And I'm, I'm excited for all of the things that we have coming up. It's going to be a power pack next couple of months with a lot of the activity we have. Let, let me just... I'll just hold up the book here. Now it says Billy's copy. So this is my personal copy, but this is a picture of the book or the actual book itself, uh, God's Road to, uh, to Financial Freedom. So anyway, I just wanted to see that. It's brand new, just came out last week. And so anyway, I wanted you to know that. Well, let's jump in talking about the nonprofits and, and uh, 
to, as we do this, uh, we're, we're getting ready to go with the slides here. Just a second. We've got that working. So we're going to talk about 15 steps to starting a successful nonprofit. And a lot of people today want to know what it, what it takes to actually start a nonprofit and what is involved. And uh, over the years, I have started quite a few nonprofits for different reasons. And we're going to talk about the different kinds of nonprofits and the critical, sometimes the critical differences uh, that are in them. But uh, tonight, we want to share uh, in some things I think that will really help you just to think through because nonprofit with a non about nonprofits, because nonprofits are kind of rare air for normal people. So we're going to try to give you some insight into them and what they're doing. So what is a nonprofit? A nonprofit is defined as an organization that exists to serve a community or advance a social cause. And it can be a ministry, a club, a society, a trade association a social advocacy group or charity, for example. And then unlike the for-profit businesses, nonprofits don't distribute their profits to their shareholders, but instead funnel them back into their operations. And of course, it's the reason they're called nonprofits. And it's also important to note that nonprofits typically have an ongoing mission and are established without an end date in mind. So really nonprofits are something that have, has come from the government meaning our laws that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight here in the U.S. But most countries around the world actually have uh, nonprofit laws and allow for you to start a nonprofit in different countries. Now, let me just say this. Many times they're called NGOs, non-governmental organizations, when you get overseas, and we use that name some here, uh, and those are primarily uh, primarily there for aid, sometimes social development, sometimes business development for the purpose of helping people. So here's the 15 steps to start a nonprofit. Number one is to hear from God. In other words, you ask yourself, am I really called to do this? We'll talk about that. And then research in the area of nonprofits and find out what fits you. We're going to talk about your vision and mission statement. We're going to talk about naming the nonprofit, forming a board of directors, uh, how to incorporate, uh, how to file for tax exemption, and then the important things that you need to do to build a foundation. We're going to uh, take a moment to talk about the business model generation canvas and a written business plan to develop the direction of where you need to go and the how-tos, so to speak, of what you need to do. We're going to talk about the importance of revenue streams, which I think is one of the most mi misunderstood things in the area of nonprofits, and then some fundraising strategies that you can use to be able to raise funds. Talk about developing brand and identity, the importance of hiring a team, some of the practical things, and we'll actually uh, cover, uh, I think in our workshop itself, we'll cover some actual software and reporting things that you'd be able to do. And then how do you plan and prepare for growth? And then there are some things uh, with ongoing compliance, especially in the US and really just about any country around the world where you have a nonprofit, there's some ongoing compliance issues that you need to make sure that you're aware of. So let's get started. And we're gonna talk about step number one, hear from God, are you called? So nonprofits are a lot of work and take commitment. And I can tell you that for a fact over the, over the years of the ones we've started and here where I'm sitting, of course, in a nonprofit today recording this, I'm in the headquarters of Andrew Walmack Ministries today. We have Karis Bible College, the campus of the college uh, right here across the street. I want to tell you, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of commitment to be successful. You've got it. You need the blessing of God and also to be wise. You know, Jesus said to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And when you're operating in the nonprofit space, it's very important that you walk in wisdom because there will be some challenges. So there's challenges that definitely come up along the way. So it's important to know that God has called you to be able to do this. And uh, it's important to understand you've got to continue to lean on him in order to do it. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know 
This is the English Standard Version. It says, and we know for those who love God, all things work together for good. And then this last part of this is, uh, which many people know this verse, but the last part is very powerful. It says, for those who are called according to his purpose. So you need to know in your own heart and your own mind uh, that it is the purpose of God for you to do this. It's really important to do that, that you know that God has called you to do it. Well, Psalms 138 and verse 8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And so really God is saying he has a purpose for our life. His love endures forever. And it's very important that we learn to run the race of our purpose. You know, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us to run the race that is set before us. And then it says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so I believe that for every one of us, when we talk about purpose, that God has given us a specific race that we are called to run in our lives. And so if a, if a piece of that specific race that God has called you to run is to operate in the nonprofit space, then that's a part of your purpose of what God is calling you to do. This step number two is research. And as we look at that, um, the question, a couple of questions you can ask yourself is, is there a need? In other words, the idea that you have. And it's really important to just see if there's, are, if there are other nonprofits out there doing that. You do the same thing in business to find out if there's a need. And, uh, and, and then you walk through that in your mind, you pray about it. And then there are some other considerations to keep in mind. Is a nonprofit really feasible for you? And then I think this next question is critical. Do you have the time and energy to devote yourself to starting this nonprofit? And let me just say this about the time and energy. I think one of the biggest mistakes, and I hope to say this again a little later, but I wanna do it right here. One of the biggest mistakes that people make in nonprofits is sometimes they're ministering to people. Let's say, for example, you want to go to Africa and be a missionary, and the people that you're actually ministering to obviously would not be the ones paying you or supporting you to be there, but you would have partners, for example, back in America. So anytime that you're helping someone in a nonprofit where they're not able to be able to financially help you, then you've got to go find the money and get people to support you. You have to remember those people are the ones you're receiving financial help from are as important customers as the ones you're actually serving in Africa. So that's a key thing to know. You've got to have revenue streams and you've got to take care of the partners or the customers that are helping you do that. And uh, do you have a cause that people would be excited to support? That's critical. It's got to make sense to them to support you. Do you have a few people in mind who'd be excited to join your board and commit themselves to your organization's success? So just remember, when it comes to the nonprofit world, board members are typically invited, just so we're clear here, this is kind of a candid statement I'm going to make. But board members out in the nonprofit space, in ministries, there may be a little bit exception to this, but in nonprofit space, board members are invited to be on, and that invitation comes with some expectation of how much they're actually going to give to support you financially. Now, if you don't know that, and that's news to you, and or maybe you've only been in the church world, I'll talk about the church world later as I get into some different pieces uh, about the legalities, but one thing I just want to say, or a board member, somebody that can contribute time and expertise to the nonprofit. So you, you want to look for boards. Sometimes you get board members that do all three, but they're also well known and they can help you. Uh, they kind of credentialize your nonprofit based by who's on there. And then uh, do you have enough money to cover the startup cost? And that's important that that uh, uh, sometimes you if, if you if you're ready to get started sometimes those are out of pocket expenses and so you just need to be aware of that and then how you're planning to fund 
your nonprofit. And we're going to, when we get later to what I mentioned earlier, the business model canvas, I'm going to talk in more detail about funding it. So let's talk about step three, vision and mission. And so uh, as we, as we look at this, this is really important because a little later when we start talking about what is your value proposition to those you're reaching out to, the vision and mission statement help you be able to give some guidance to that value proposition. So right now you may not know what I mean by value proposition. We're going to help you help you with that here in just a minute. So a vision statement is a description of your end goal. What is the purpose of your nonprofit? And this will be the motivator and driving force for your day-to-day -day activities and your team's activities. So you, it's important that you have a, a good uh, vision statement. And so your nonprofit's mission statement is a brief description of what you do and why you do it. And it plays an important role in your organization's success because it tells people why your work is worth supporting. So here's just a couple of things that you can do uh, when it comes to your mission statement. And that is, needs to be short and simple. I think we're gonna give you an example here in a second. You make it specific, you make it timeless, and it answers how you're gonna go about accomplishing your vision. And so as we talk about this, uh, on the, we're there later on in the slide presentation, we're going to go a little more into the vision and the mission statement. And the vision and mission statement really set you up uh, for where you're going to go and the direction that your nonprofit will take. And then step number four is naming your nonprofit. And uh, let's, uh, as we talk about this, it's important. And so here, for example, when we talk about wealth builders, as an example, we say our mission, this is a mission statement that we just talked about, is to inspire and equip others to make sense of making money for making a difference for the purpose of transforming individuals, cities, and nations. And so the truth is, is that when we start talking about the name, it's, it's, it's very good. And I'm going to say something here that's a little, a tad sophisticated. If you can name your nonprofit and that name of that nonprofit actually also is a good enough name to be your brand, uh, then, for example, that's what we did with Wealth Builders. So we named our nonprofit Wealth Builders, the one that we're talking about here. And, uh, and then it's also becomes our brand. And we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more about some of your taglines and things you do. But sometimes you will name a nonprofit almost an innocuous name just for other kinds of legal protection reasons. And you can DBA, for example, a brand underneath that nonprofit, and that's totally legal. And if anybody asks that in the questions, we'll go into more detail about what that looks like and how you do that. Uh, just always remember this when we're teaching on this kind of stuff. A little later, we're going to get on to the legal corporation. Always remember your legal paperwork for the corporation or the entity or the trust is always filed in the states that you live in or in states that you're going to operate in. And so that's very important to know. And when you, when you use a brand that's different than that legal name, then you have to do what's called a DBA and file that in the state. DBA means doing business as. So that's something to know when we start talking about uh, brand. So in order to get the, the names uh, to really work on what you're going to call it, you can start with questions like my nonprofit will. In other words, it'll do what, for example, and my nonprofit helps. That's who. And then our members are, right? So the truth is, is you want to make sure you start understanding these things uh, so that you can think through it and, and pray about it. So once you pick the name, make sure another organization doesn't have the same name. And of course, you number one, you can do a Google search, but then you've got to do a quasi-legal search by just going to the Secretary of State's website 
in the state that you're in and see who's using that name. Sometimes there's not a legal entity with that name, but sometimes there's a DBA with that name. So it's important that you, you look at that. And then next, as we talk about this, step number five is form your board of directors. Now, the truth is I could spend, uh, truthfully, I could do a whole webinar on just forming your board of directors. I referred to some things earlier about, you know, they either help you financially or they bring expertise or in some type cases, they bring celebrity to the table. But let's talk about your board of directors for a second and make sure that as we walk through this, we help you understand some things. I believe that'll be a blessing. So we have in bold here at the top of this slide, you'll want to recruit the best for your board of directors and ensure you trust them to have your best interests at heart. So one of the things that I want to say to most of you who would be starting nonprofits, there may be people on here, you've had several nonprofits. Uh, so maybe in the Q and A, we can, we have time, we can, I can talk about the different approaches you take, but for most of you listening today, you need to, you need to have people on your board who, who you know, and you don't, you don't put people, for example, with celebrity on your board till you know who they are. And then once you have people who, that you know, and you trust on your board, then sometimes you can invite other people. I think one of the biggest mistakes I see even in the nonprofit space is people make mistakes by putting the wrong people on their board. That's more important, getting the right person on there to help you. That's more important than someone with celebrity or someone with expertise or someone with money. So you, you, it's important that you realize you need somebody who's going to support you and what you feel like God has called you to do. And so so, of course, in here, the nonprofit answer guide says your board should be made up of people who have expertise and resources in different areas, and that people should be evenly split between those who can help you raise money, uh, those who either have expertise in some areas, or those who are connected, maybe have celebrity or some kind of credentialization you provide. But I want to emphasize that if you start a nonprofit, you need to make sure that they're connected to you and that you can trust them when you ask them to be on your board. And so, you, and most of the time we have on here, once you've selected your board members, you have them sign a board member contract. Usually what will happen is, is that if you're, if you're gonna kind of be in a totally secular nonprofit, having that a board contract could also, will also include what the agreements are going to be and how you're going to function. It'll also have a small uh, amount of job description inside of there. But most of the time, your board members, you'll, you'll define what those are and list the expectations. And by the way, we have some of that stuff uh, available in our uh, toolbox that we haven't made available uh, too much, uh, at least publicly in recent years. But once you have them selected, then you will use the board not only to get them in a contract, they'll also help you sign your founding papers. So the founding board would be able to help you, uh, should be able to help you do that. Step number six is to incorporate. And that's where we're talking about going to the state. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, thank you. Here are the steps to incorporating your nonprofit. Uh, number one, choose a business name. We talked about that already. Number two, point of board of directors. We talked about that. And then number three, decide on a legal structure. Now, for 98% for of the, those of you that are watching or view this video, 98% of you, it will be a corporation. It will not be a trust or an association. If we have time, I'll talk about a little bit about both of those. Most of the time, trusts are more, more, more for uh, private foundation type nonprofits and true associations. Now, an association can be a car association, but it can also be some kind of ministry association. And so there's a pretty big difference in compliance between those two, for, for example, a car association would have a much higher level of compliance uh, that we talk about later than what a ministry association would. So for most of you, you're going to, you're going to 
have a what we would call a regular corporation type guideline, and it will need to have the not your nonprofit articles in there. Many of you I know who are watching this are faith based people, you're Christians, uh, the majority of you who are watching. And so you will want a faith, a faith based some kind of faith statement that are that's in your articles, and also a really good purpose statement, which could be your mission statement that you put in those articles um, and our articles and bylaws of the corporation. And so for most of you, 98% of you watching, the type of legal structure will be a corporation. You'll have a board and you'll have officers, president, vice president, and secretary treasurer. Uh, that's for the majority of you out there. Now, just so you know, there are there is such a thing as a nonprofit LLC. A lot of people today use the nonprofit LLC, which we can talk about. And most of the time in a nonprofit LLC, you would still have uh, officers similar to what I'm talking to you about right now, uh, but sometimes the number of officers sometimes is just a husband and wife in that nonprofit LLC. So right now, most of you that are, that are watching this by far would just use what we call uh, the corporation setup for your nonprofit. Number four, you'd file your incorporation paperwork, and uh, you have to remember that as you file, you just have to know what your state is asking for. And remember, in the corporation file paperwork, you will file articles of incorporation, which will have some of this language, but your articles, when you file them with the state, are pretty short. But then when you get to your bylaws, that's where things get really detailed about how you're going to function, what you're going to do, the thing that's called the dissolution clause for nonprofits that, that if you were to... Uh, dissolve your nonprofit, that, that the actual assets, et cetera, would go to another nonprofit. All of that would be in, the, in that corporation bylaws uh, so that when you file to the IRS, which we're going to talk about a little later, uh, then all, the IRS will require you to have certain language in, that, in those corporation bylaws and in some cases articles um, in order to be able to get uh, your tax deduction letter, which we'll talk about that. Number five is that in this process of incorporating, you need to get an employer identification number. It's called an EIN. And just like any business, your nonprofit needs to get that. And then the really the EINs are pretty simple. All you need to do is provide your physical mailing address for your nonprofit, its legal name, and your social security number, then once you get it done and you get an EIN, you won't operate any longer with your social security number. You'll operate, that'll be its own corporation, its own entity, and its own person, so to speak, and you will operate with the actual uh, EIN number. So let's talk about step number seven, and this is a really big one. This is filing for tax exemption and that when we file for tax exemption, one of the main benefits of incorporating a nonprofit and starting a 501c3, which by the way, once you go to the IRS, this 501c3 is actually a tax exempt code and, uh, and status that the IRS is the one that recognizes you as a 501c. C3. Now you can put that in your articles that you're going to operate as a 501c3, but one of the things that's really critical is you have to file with the IRS to get your tax exemption. I want to say it one more time. You do not file with the state. You file with the IRS and you take those articles and send them in and they have a whole packet. Are you ready for this now? The, it, and it's called a 1023. It's under the revenue code of 023, but the actual packet and application that you have to file is called a 1023. And so there are many different types of organizations that are 501Cs, but 98% uh, of you would be filing for a 501C3. And you have to, and in order to get that 
with the with the IRS, you'll have to file. And then later, there's a letter that comes with that, and uh, and it helps you know where you need to be. So it's very important that you do that. So we're going to go to the next slide here. Or I think we are. There we are. Step number eight. Let's talk about building a foundation. Now, by the way, when we get to compliance, I'm going to come back to the 990 stuff and, and, and talk about a few other nuances there that'll help you. So let's talk about building a foundation and let's talk about what kind of founder you'll be. And this is just to let you know, and uh, this is according to leadership expert, Brian Tracy. And he said, he, he listed these five traits. The first one is self-discipline. In other words, this is you. And I always say, and I'm going to say this, by the way, I'm going to teach on this in the business workshop, how you continue to position yourself in your nonprofit or how you continue to position yourself in your business is critical, is critical to how well it's going to actually grow and develop. So there's there that may not make sense to some of you right now, but as you start building and you start growing what it is the Lord has called you to do, there will always be a challenge of how you continue to position yourself. In other words, do you hire people to do certain things and you do other things? And how do you delegate all of those things? So personally, the self-discipline is learning to make those adjustments, even even when I like to say, even when it doesn't meet your felt needs, you've got to do what's best for the organization of the business. And then, of course, integrity, that's critical. And, uh, and that's both in your leadership, that people have to know they can trust you. People giving to you have to know they can trust you. And then persistence. And I think that's uh, persistence is something, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 6 and verse 12, that through faith and patience, Another word for the word patience there is the word persistence. Through faith and persistence, uh, you're able to inherit the promises. So it's, it's, uh, it's important that you learn not to quit, right? Don't quit. Keep going. Keep moving in the vision and the mission that God called you to. And then there needs to be a clear, a clear sense of direction. Now, I want to read this. Uh, in Brian's experience, he seemed motivated entrepreneurs get hijacked by the day-to-day -day task and short-term problems that naturally arise from starting an organization. And what that really is, and some of you have heard of this cliche here, is that to be smart, you have to work, learn to work on your business, not in your business. So when you get absorbed with day-to-day -day tasks and problem solving all the time, that's that positioning I'm talking about, and you end up Instead of working on your business, you end up working in your business. And if you're not careful, you just started something to give yourself a job. You have to continue to position yourself so you can continue to provide direction to uh, the, the, your organization, your nonprofit. And then you got to be decisive and action oriented. You can't sit around and ponder all day. You've got to be able to make some decisions and move forward. And remember the best decisions, you're not looking to make the, excuse me, remember you're not looking to make the best decisions. You're looking to make better decisions and better decisions are when both your heart and your head are involved going back and forth. You get in trouble if you just make a head decision. Sometimes you get in trouble if you just make a heart decision. You've got to combine the two and create a process. That's how you, So the key is not just making a decision. It's having a better process as you think through things and you listen to your heart, listen to the Holy Spirit. You will then know better what you need to do in making those decisions. So another question is the team you're going to build. So who will be involved in your nonprofit? And, um, and I think one of the key things that's really important, and we put it here in the slide, is you need to make a list of the roles that, need, uh, that you'll need to fill. And you'll be everything from your board members, which are more of the legal roles, to your volunteers, which, of course, in many cases, your day-to-day -day roles and things that have to happen. And uh, you may even have to hire some people here, a few staff members, 
And, you know, here where I'm sitting today, we have 766 employees in this nonprofit here. And if you count around the world, it's well over a thousand. So nonprofits can grow, they can expand, they can be built. And uh, then this next, this, this sentence below, also think about someone who can offer legal advice, help fill out the paperwork. You need a mentor, people that can help you with finance and marketing, those kind of things. So it's very important that you understand about when you're building this foundation, what kind of roles do you need in your nonprofit? Now, this next one is, uh, is one that's just absolutely critical, and that's to do a business model generation canvas and a written business plan. It's important that you learn. I want to give you the statement worth the price of the ticket, and here it is. You have to learn to think on paper. A lot of people say it doesn't come natural to me. I don't like that. Maybe, Billy, it comes natural to you. Well, the truth is sometimes it does not come natural to me, uh, but the truth is you've got to learn to think on paper. So it's important as we look at this, here is uh, an example of a regular business model canvas. And uh, one of the things as we go through this, there's nine boxes on this canvas. And uh, the one that you fill out the first is the value proposition. And when we do the workshop, we're gonna give you some examples of how you write value propositions. But the first thing you fill out is you're really talking about how you're gonna help the people that you're gonna to minister to. And remember nonprofits is critical. That sometimes in these situations, you have to have two value propositions. You have to have one for the people you're gonna to minister to. And then you have to have another one for those that are gonna help fund your operation. And that helps you identify who your customer segments are. You see there as you're looking at the screen to your far right, and that's who you're going to help. And then the next one that's critical is what on here, it says distribution channels. And the truth is it's the channels, it's how you're going to reach your customers. That's, that's those channels. And so it's not just how are you gonna get goods and services, and I think that's one of the biggest mistakes people do uh, when they're working on the BMGC. It's a little bit early yet to talk about how you're going to deliver goods and services. That still goes there. But what goes there more is how are you going to reach those customer segments? In other words, how are you going to market to them? How are you going to get them to participate? How are you going to get them to buy in, especially your donors? But in business, for those of you that may be watching this and, and you're really thinking of business, it's really how are you going to reach those customer segments specifically. And I give the illustration about Miss Becky and I years ago, that's my wife, we would, we would walk into a big Barnes and Noble store. And it, usually before we went and looked at the books we wanted to look at, we would go to the magazine rack. And so the question I have uh, she's, of course, a female, thank the Lord. And so she would walk up to certain kinds of magazines. So what kind of magazines do you think she would go get look at? Well, she's looking at, you know, home and garden, uh, anything that was like HGTV. Uh, and then she, she even liked, to, she's married, but she liked to look at bridal magazines. And then there was a few for clothes. And so, but I'm a guy, what do you think I went and looked at? Was well, a guy I went and looked at fishing magazines and hunting magazines, and I also looked at financial magazines. You say, well, what's the point, Billy? The point is those magazines are channels that we automatically went to. We went to those channels to find what was that we things we were interested in. So that's more accurate. So you have to know. One of the questions I always pose, and this is worth the price of the ticket, is how do you hunt a moose? You have to go where a new moose lives, where a, new, where a moose plays, where a moose eats. If you're going to hunt a moose, you got to go where the moose is and understand the habits of a moose. That's how you find your customer segments. And your customer relationships are how you continue to relate to, your, to the customer you get once you get them. So in the case of a nonprofit, that's both your customers are both the people you're ministering to and those that are helping fund what you're doing. 
And so as we do that, remember this, the very bottom, you, you must have revenue streams in order to be able to pay for what you're doing. Someone has to contribute. There has to be money coming in in order to be able to pay for what you're doing. Now, if you're going to do an, a private nonprofit, then all you need to do is a value proposition, private, meaning you're going to self-fund it. So if you're going to self-fund the nonprofit, then all you have to do that be important is to do a business model canvas on who you're going to minister to. But the truth is, as we do this, it's important to that you understand you're going to have to have revenue streams. And then on the left side of the canvas, you can make a list of what, what we call key activities. That is, what are you going to need to do to carry out the work of the nonprofit? What kind of things are key activities, not just every activity, but key activities to deliver your value proposition to your customer segment? And then key resources, what are you going to need? You know, sometimes a key resource could be a software program. Sometimes the key resource can be a person or a couple of people. Sometimes a key resource could be a building. So what kind of key resources are you going to need to be able to fulfill this value proposition? And then sometimes you're going to have to reach out and find some key partners. And really, truthfully, no matter how big the nonprofit grows or how, how small the nonprofit is, there, well, the smaller you are, the more key partners typically you'll have. Those aren't just your financial partners that we're talking about. We're talking about other kinds of partners that help you deliver the value proposition. Now, in the workshop, we're going to break this down a lot further and give you example by example. And then the cost structure, what's it going to cost you to be able to do these things? And we'll circle that to you so that, so that you can see it. So do a BM, I'm almost out of time, so let me kind of cover these, but make sure you do a BMGC and a written business plan, and we're going to cover how to do a business plan in the workshop. So then we go here to the next step, number 10, the revenue streams and fundraising strategies. You have to have that. So most nonprofits will actually uh, sustain, build revenue and sustain revenue You've got to provide value. You've got to go out in a nonprofit somewhere and fundraise. And sometimes you can raise money from government grants, but you've got to have a plan to actually know what you're doing. And then step number 11 is develop brand, uh, uh, really it's brand identity, develop brand identity. And uh, you can think about things you need to, like your logo, the voice and tone of your messaging, brand colors, design guidelines, and a strong thought out brand will help you stand out. So it's important that you understand. Remember, a brand is what somebody thinks about you when they think about your name or they see your logo or they see your tagline. The truth is, is what that person perceives you as being that actually becomes your brand. So with Wealth Builders, Wealth Builders is our, our largest brand, and it's the one that we use uh, the majority of the time. And so that brand begins to create what other people think about you. So it's important that you develop that. Step number 12, we talked about this a little bit, is hiring a team. And so you want to make sure that you have the right people. Remember the book, Good to, Eight, Good to Great, excuse me, Jim Collins, you got to get uh, people on the bus, on the right bus, and then you got to get them in the right seat on the bus. So here's some things in this slide that'll show you some of the kinds of things that you need in order to be the uh, team members that you may need. And most beginners and most people that are starting nonprofits, they actually fill every one of those roles that we have here uh, on this list, administrator, marketing specialist, fundraising specialist, events coordinator, finance, legal, HR, accounting, on and on. They end up filling all of those roles. And so in the very beginning, if you're just one person operating, you're going to have to do that. That's why I, I tell you it's critical how you continue to position yourself. And then step 13, we're going to talk about more in the workshop, some nonprofit software and reporting tools that you can use. So we, we'll see that. And there's some really good comprehensive options that are already out there. You don't have to 
reinvent the wheel. So you see that step 14 is plan and prepare for growth. And uh, so began to think in terms of a one year, three year, five year growth plan. And honestly, if you can think out to a five year growth plan and really see it, and then there may be some long term stuff you can see and dream about, we would call that your 10 year plan. And so you learn to build out what your future revenue streams and other things are going to be. And then step 15, ongoing compliance. This is a big one. And uh, I want to point out in here that uh, that if you that for most of you watching this, about 98% of you, you'll have to file what's called a 990 form. Now there's actually three kinds of nine, uh, primarily three kinds of 990 forms. One of them is just a little green postcard that you have to fill out to report to the IRS. But that is if you have, if your gross revenue receipts over the last three years have averaged not more than $50,000 annually. So you could have one year where you had 70,000 and another year where you had 30,000 and the, and the balance is 50. If you're, if you're down in there and you don't have assets over $200,000, uh, it's, it's 50,000 in income assets of 200,000, then you have to file a 990. Now, if you're a church or an association of churches, then, uh, which we will talk about at the workshop, then when, if you are that, then you do not have to file any kind of 990 and you don't have any compliance other than your payroll taxes that really where the IRS is involved. Now, if you have gross seats over, then you can, over 50,000, you can file, uh, uh, you can file, it's about 50,000 to about 200,000. If, if you're in that neighborhood, you can file a short form 990. If you're above 200,000 in, in revenue and, you're, uh, and you go up above that 200,000 in assets and you have to do what's called a long form 990. And believe me, that is worse than any personal tax return or business tax return you ever have to fill out. It's more detailed. You know, your taxes, when you file as a business, those are private. That's between you and the IRS. People can't access your tax returns. However, anybody can access your 990, just so you're clear. So 990s are a big deal. And so it's, it's important that you have a good, good accountant to be able to form, to be able to, uh, to help you with that. So I'm going to go and turn this back. This is the 15 steps. I'm going to give it back to Karen. I want to tad long and we'll take some questions now. That's great, Billy. Wow. Awesome information. Thank you so much. You know, one of the things I was reading, I don't know if you remember this or not, but when uh, Ben Carson was running for president, he made the comment that nine out of 10 nonprofits fail. Uh, yeah. That's tough to get statistics around that, but the main reason is lack of strategic planning. Absolutely. The truth is they don't know what they're gonna face. And honestly, that statistic is pretty accurate for people that start businesses. And that's why it's so important that one of the things you do is learn to think on paper. Oh, learn that's great. Down where you're going and write it down so you can look at it and read it all the time. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's the same thing with business. And so that's why we're doing this workshop is to help people when there's a dream that God has put in your heart or, you know, passion or calling, we want to help you be successful. And that's what Billy is talking about. It takes more than just a wish and a prayer, right? I mean, I wish it was just that, but right. we found that it takes a lot more work than that. <laughs> yeah, and I really think nonprofits in a lot of ways are more work than building a business. Yeah, I agree. The revenue streams are a little bit more um, complicated. You know, you have to think it through. And a lot of times you we run into this a lot, Billy. You talk to care students, every uh, that has a dream, they want to have a ministry and you help them to understand like, well, how are you going to fund your ministry? That's it. And that's a big deal. Matter of fact, if, if, if you don't have money, it's hard to do anything. So true. Well, we've got a lot of great questions coming in, but I do want to take a moment just to read a couple comments here. Uh, first of all, we have got uh, Chris Gale on. Thank you. She said, love this, Billy. Uh, hallelujah. Commenting on it. And she's a partner. She received your book and she says, thank you. She's really enjoying it. 
Yeah, and also Kurt, thanks for joining us. Um, he said, hey, Billy Epperhart, Kurt Poole, thanks again, brother. He appreciates it. And uh, he was asking, he wants to re, you know, re-watch this. And so for all of you that are signed up uh, on the Zoom where we've got your email, we're going to be sending a copy of this webinar out to you along with the PowerPoint so that you can watch it again. There's so much information, so thanks for that. Also, this is great. We've got someone on from Madagascar, Billy. <laughs> wow, really? So, so Jax is on and he says, thank you very much. And he wants you to know that he is from Madagascar watching this tonight. Wow, well, thank you for watching. All right, let's get to some questions here. We have got Eric Backland on. Eric, thank you so much. Eric always has great questions and, and he's got a couple here. So I'm gonna just start with the first one. He says, my understanding is that founders can also serve as the board of directors as long as there are at least three directors in most states. Are there any issues with this? Well, sometimes the IRS will have issues, but most of the time it, the, the, the law has changed and the IRS was very strict for a period of time where you actually had to have five board members. Now, in a corporation, for the state, you can actually get by, uh, if, if, now we're talking corporation now, you can actually probably get by with two members, but I think in a nonprofit, it's better if you have three members or three uh, officers in that corporation. And so always remember when you're forming a nonprofit, you have what's called members, board members, and then officers. So the founders, most of those listening to me tonight, you will want yourself and your spouse and maybe one other person to be the members. The members actually have a right to select the board members. If your articles are written properly, they have the right to select the board members either every year or every three years, depending on what you put in. That gives you room, especially if you do it every year, it gives you room to appoint some people uh, to your board, so to speak, and then you'll have to vote, but gives you some people where you as a member and the founding member can actually appoint those board members every year. But then you have to let the board members and you can, by the way, the, all three of the members can also be board members. And then you can add say two others that are outside, but the founding members can appoint whoever the board members are, including themselves, say for one year, and then you reappoint, then those board members would run more of the oversight and the policy decisions. And then your officers, their role is to execute. So in theory, a member can also be a board member and can also be the president. So some nonprofit articles will compress it. And they won't have members, they'll just have board members and officers. But my suggestion for most of you that are watching, if you're going to do a corporation, you have members, board members, and officers. That's great, Billy. Thank you so much. A follow-up from Eric is, he's found that many states have a boilerplate articles of incorporation. Is it best to use that boilerplate or should you go out and do your own, perhaps with an attorney? For articles... Uh, and it's important to understand the distinction. You, the articles are typically much shorter uh, that just to file to get a corporation filed. It's the bylaws that really become your operating agreement. And so the bylaws, what you put in there, especially if you're going to be faith based. So you might, you can even, and I encourage you to do this if you're faith based, to even put a few doctrinal statements in there put your purpose statement in there. And I'm not talking about a church or association of churches. I'm talking about a nonprofit, but you're going to be faith-based. It's important that you do that. My suggestion and recommendation is that you go to an attorney, but you go to someone, don't go to any attorney. You have to go to a nonprofit attorney that, that does, and we have in our office, Karen, we have several references for nonprofit attorneys that we can recommend. That's great, Billy. You are just the best at just helping to ensure that um, nonprofits are protected and there's a lot to that. There's a lot happening. And so I just want to encourage people, um, when you come to this workshop, you're going to learn more about that as well. 
All right, this is a great question. It's going to make you smile, Billy. This is Neil Gor Gorsuch, and his question is, how can I invest in real estate through a nonprofit? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, you can definitely do it. So let me, let me give you a, 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 broad, a broad explanation and then I'll bring it down and I'll land the plane. The first thing you have to understand is that true nonprofits can have passive income, but they cannot have earned income. It's called unrelated business income. So the only kind of income they can have is from donations. However, nonprofits can own passive investments. Let me give you an example. You cannot with a nonprofit go buy and flip houses because anytime you buy and flip in 12 months or less, meaning you buy the house, you renovate the house and you sell the house, all that's done in 12 months or less, that's considered earned income. The only way you can do that is have a discipleship program that is put with that, where you're discipling people and training them how to flip houses, then you probably could do that in a nonprofit. But you can buy and hold real estate. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend the nonprofit on the real estate. I would recommend that the nonprofit own a corporation that owns the land trust where you hold the real estate, but you can, it, it can actually own uh, passive income real estate and have investments. And that means you have to hold the property for more than 12 months. There an income coming from rent would in that level, in that place, then you would not be taxed and it would not be illegal. So you can do that. Now at the workshop, I'm going to put up a couple of diagrams that will actually show uh, the participants in the workshop how I do that. And so I'm going to give that to them in the workshop. And then I'm going to tell you things you can't do. And you got to make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's. But there's things that you can do in your nonprofit that are totally legal, but the, primarily the qualifier is it has to be passive income for the nonprofit. Wow, Billy, that is really great. And you've been mentoring Dan Dyer for years, and he does a lot in this too. It, it, there's a lot to it, but when you do it right, it just sounds like it is an amazing opportunity. All right, we only have time for one more question. And so this is from Tommy O'Brien. And um, it's something, it's a little bit about a nonprofit that he feels called to. So I'm gonna read this to you and then get your okay. input on this question. Right. He said he believes that he is called to start a school to teach how to build your own small homes in Teller County and beyond. The students will have both classroom and on the job training. The homes would range from 500 to 800 square feet, affordable and attainable. So as he's looking at this and listening to what you're saying tonight, his question is, should I break these ideas up into a school and a building company possibly that could fall under one nonprofit? Uh, or how would you look at structuring something like this from the start? Well, I think you probably, if you know, you, you would have to keep it centered on the educational aspect. So the building the home, would be, and this is what Dan does that I, that I showed him, it was Century Trust. And so, but there's some nuances with what Dan was able to do legally because he, he had paid cash for everything and there was no debt, there was no mortgages. So there was a few things he could do. Now, just to answer that, I think you could do both of those inside of a nonprofit and you have to, you would have to show that uh, that as you do that in the nonprofit, then the the tuition or whatever to the school would be considered business related income, and so the tuition would not be investments. Now, when it came to doing the homes and selling the actual homes, you would you would have, there there would you'd have to be careful there, uh, except if you put a discipleship program. And you said, I'm taking the students and I'm showing them how to build what they're in. And then you help some of them get in and you covered your cost for doing that. None of that would be taxable. That would be related business income. 
And so you could do it that way. And then you could also raise donations. So you not only have tuition, you not only have covering your costs for building the homes, but you also would uh, could go and get donations as well into that nonprofit. Now, what I'll say in that kind of program, you just described, uh, you're going to fill out more than likely a full blown 990. And if you've never done that, I'm telling you now, it makes K ones and real estate schedules and your personal taxes, what we call the partnership type returns. It makes those look like a picnic when it comes to having, because they're, they're going to ask you all kinds of personal information on that 990. Billy, that is great. Thank you so much. And uh, we are completely out of time. And so I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Billy, thank you so much for doing this. We've got a lot of great questions, such good engagement. We've had people that have stayed on the entire time to hear what you have to say. And I think this is just something too, why we are adding this nonprofit segment to the workshop is we know a lot of people that are a part of Wealth Builders have a heart. They want to reach a community. They want to start a nonprofit. And we are here to help you to be successful with that. And so there are a lot of keys that we're going to be sharing with you. We have got multiple speakers that will be there. Um, you'll be hearing from them in future webinars. And so we just invite you to be a part of this workshop. You can go to wealthbuilders.org slash events. Uh, and if you've not yet uh, signed up for our email list, you'll want to do that. Share this with others. Um, in my opinion, and I realize I'm part of the Wealth Builders organization, but nobody is doing what Billy and Becky are doing. And I was just sharing with Billy, we've been traveling all over the world, and I just can't believe the connection that people have with Wealth Builders all over the world. And so, Billy, thank you. Just a thank you to Becky. I know she's not on tonight, but she is such a big part of everything that Wealth Builders does. So God bless you all. Have a great night and we look forward to seeing you soon.